Welcome everyone. This is class number 14 of the July 2023 IBIS Prep Florida Bar Crash Course. And today we're going to be discussing Florida criminal procedure. So as we know, Florida procedure when it comes to multiple choice is extremely important because it's guaranteed to be tested. Unlike business entities, which now includes commercial paper and secure transactions, or wills, which now includes trusts, those subjects <clears throat> that I just mentioned are not guaranteed to be tested. They can be tested. Procedure is guaranteed to be tested. Even evidence is not guaranteed to be tested, but you can bet it will be tested. It usually always is tested, but sometimes it may not be tested. But evidence is very, very likely to be tested. It's either going to be the business conglomerate or the <clears throat> wills trust conglomerate, um, but it will always be procedure. So make sure that you feel comfortable with procedure. Uh, we're gonna go into uh, the crash course today and um, we'll see what we can uncover. So if we look at the calendar, just to make sure we're staying focused, we did contracts, we did torts, we did con law, we did property. Now we did civ pro and today we're doing crim pro. We're gonna have a workshop we're gonna have a workshop on Saturday and then uh, hopefully everyone will feel pretty good about procedure, but don't shy away from it. I showed everyone my strategy of how to master this. I really think you should take a QBank um, and memorize every single answer on the QBank because that will reinforce those rules in your head. And that's really the best way to ultimately study for Florida multiple choice. And we're gonna do that during the workshop. Uh, there's no class. This is our first class off of any of my courses on Monday, um, the 19th, <clears throat> and then we'll come back and do Florida evidence on Wednesday. We'll take uh, a workshop on the following Saturday, and during that workshop, we might even do some procedure. That'll be like an evidence procedure killer workshop. And then we'll do the other multiple choice sections, the original other ones, wills and business entities, take off for the 4th of July weekend come back and we'll do family law, which is an essay subject. And then instead of having a workshop here, we're gonna do um, article three and article nine. So now that I realize that this workshop right here, we're gonna actually include some of the other subjects too. It's gonna be, uh, these are our only two Florida multiple choice workshops. So we'll try to include some of the other subjects, but we won't have the sub substantive lectures for article three, article nine and trust until July. Florida's tough. There's a lot of subjects they throw at us, and I want to be diligent about it. Then we'll do ethics, do a proctored exam. It'll probably last longer than that, but we'll do a proctored exam. And then I even reserved a final week of review. My other courses, UBE and MBE, all end this week, but it's very important to me that we have a final review. So we'll review the 17th and 19th, and then Saturday, the 22nd. A lot of people are probably traveling that day or whatever it may be, but it'll be recorded and my whole <clears throat> purpose is to make this course as valuable as possible, to leave no stone unturned. And, you know, July is more difficult that, for me than February, because by the time people graduate law school and the time the test is administered, I really don't have that much time. And there's a bunch of holidays that occur. So it does move along swiftly from this point. Any questions about the calendar that anyone may have? Okay. So we're gonna get into Florida Crim Pro. And um, I told people to, to do the other practice questions we have in the folder that I explained before class. And then the questions that we made, the Ibis Prep questions are the ones that we're specifically going to do on <clears throat> Saturday, but uh, we're still tinkering them a little bit. So I wouldn't touch them yet until Saturday. Focus on the other questions that are in that folder. Uh, I wanna start off with, um, I guess the PowerPoint, and then I'm gonna do Joel's outline because Joel's outline is super thorough. I think the PowerPoint is just a good way to get our toes wet. It's a, uh, Trim Pro is tough. It's tough to teach because it's procedure, right? It's not literally not substantive. Um, so this is uh, some things that occur. And honestly, Barbara, are you with us today? All right, I, I feel like you could explain this concept to everyone because 
you know, I can explain it from a test taking perspective, but you actually do this for a living. And granted, you do it in California. So I don't want you to talk about the dates and the specifics. But just as yesterday, I explained to the class, and for those who are in my MBE Civ Pro class, the life cycle of the case, right? When someone, you know, is charged with a civil complaint and then, you know, they have opportunities to defend themselves and then maybe it'll go to trial and then maybe there'll be a judgment and then an appeal and these different processes. Could you explain to the best of your ability, which I'm sure is pretty solid, the life cycle of criminal procedure and when someone maybe gets arrested to, you know, when they either get put in jail or get declared a free person? Sure. Um, so I'll try to make it pretty basic because um, it, it can depend from state to even county what the procedure may be. But generally, if someone, so let's say you get, um, you have police contact, there's two ways that you are going to be contacted by an officer if there's actually a case. Um, or they're going to charge you with the case, it's through a citation, which means that they give you a piece of paper and say, here's your court date for your arraignment, which like Donald Trump yesterday had his arraignment in federal district court. Um, and so in state court, you would just go to whatever like local municipality your courthouse would be on that date, you're out of custody, whatever. Um, if you're arrested, and you're actually detained and taken into custody, then there will be some statutory period of time uh, where you will have a right to see a judge to discuss uh, your your custody status. So, um, yeah. can I ask a question? Sorry if I interrupt. Sure. I just want to, I want to fill in details. So yeah. you said citation. What about information and indictment? What do those terms mean? So an information in California, um, an information is. So before, so prior, so basically a criminal case in California has two stages. To be fair, in Florida, you can, yeah. all, all three of these are ways you can. Okay. So an indictment or um, an information. information. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're just filing the formal charges, depending on what stage of the case um, you're in. So uh, oftentimes an indictment is after a grand jury. Exactly. That's what I was thinking. Indictment is like big crimes, like major it, crimes. It, it can be, but it can also be if the DA can elect to do it on any felony charges. So, okay, yeah. cool. So you yeah. get arrested, they give you the, you know, information, whatever you're, you're called to uh, court or you're handcuffed or whatever it may be. And then you talked about arraignment and I, that was interesting. So you said Donald Trump was, had an arraignment. Can you explain to the class what happens at an arraignment? Yeah, so um, Donald, so yeah, at an arraignment, it's it's the, it's the basically the jump off or the kickoff to your criminal case. You, uh, you are read your, the, basically you're read what the charges are against you because even if a police officer cites you or arrests you for a certain crime, um, it doesn't mean that the prosecuting body will actually file those charges. So that's the arraignment is when you know absolutely what your charges are, what the date was, and it's got to be with some specificity um, so that you are on notice. So I don't, I mean, and we don't have to make this political at all, please. I don't really follow anything. I just, someone told me that I saw a clip on the news that said Donald Trump uh, didn't even speak and his attorney they asked him to plea and he said, not guilty, like, of, like, whatever. So is that what happens at arraignment? You make your plea of guilty or not guilty? Right, that's right. Um, every single one of my clients pleads not guilty at arraignment because we haven't even looked at the case yet. So you have to make, you have to enter a plea at that point. Okay, and then, I mean, let's take some different scenarios and, and don't worry, this is just conceptual. I think this is very interesting to, conceptualize it from the real world. We'll go into all the details, but like, let's take a scenario where someone is um, arrested and, you know, the, someone calls the police and they come to the house and the guy's doing a crime and they arrest him. They take him to jail. What's, what are that person's rights and what's going to happen to that person from the time they're arrested to the time they're actually, you know, given a trial. And let's say they are pretty much, it looks like they're guilty. Like maybe you might think you have a chance at it, but like, there's reason to 
hold them in jail? And you know, what rights do they have is, is my main question. So you have a lot of different rights, but um, once you've been booked into custody, let's, let's do it that way. Um, one of your rights is that you could bail, you can post bail. Um, uh, but if let's say you can't at, at the arraignment, your attorney can bring up um, a, a lowering of a bail or they can bring up um, just a release of custody status, period. So that's a right you have at, at arraignment. And you're doing a great job with this. I know you didn't expect to teach today, but I tried to call Will, who does a uh, um, criminal procedure in Florida, but he was busy, but maybe we'll come another day. So I have to count on you. But um, wait, what is bail? What's the purpose of bail? Bail is an evil thing, in my opinion. And basically, uh, there's a bail schedule, usually by county. Um, each crime has a, a number associated with how much money you have to post to get out of jail. And usually people contact uh, a bail bondsman and you only have to post, you only have to give the bail bondsman about 10% of what the total bail will be. And then they'll go ahead and post the bail with the court. I've bailed someone out before for the record. I like to help people. Um, I have a, I have a quote. Sorry, is bail, does, does bail happen before like formal charges? So like when the person is first taken into custody? So when the officers arrest you, um, they will arrest you with certain charges with bail associated to those charges. It just doesn't mean later on the district attorney or the prosecuting body right. might change the charges and the bail might be different then. Right. That, that's when after you can end up staying in jail for whatever amount of years, et cetera. Okay. So when it's you- like, this, oh, like the pre-trial, like this is pre-trial, right? The bail. So when you um, have this idea of bail, you said you post a bond, right? And it's a little bit. Does anyone besides uh, Barbara, because I'm sure she knows, but don't worry, Barbara, you're not off the hook. So stay alert. Um, does anyone know what the purpose of this uh, bond is? Three prongs. Like um, the purpose of it is to ensure the integrity of the judicial system to ensure that the defendant actually shows up to, to trial or for his future hearings, to, uh, to ensure that he's not a danger to the community. I think those are the three, I don't think they're right. right. And what everyone else is talking about is interesting too. <clears throat> those are, you know, why would you not let someone um, out on bail? Um, and they're saying some of these reasons because they're a flight risk or they're danger to society or things like that. That's correct, Barbara, we're not gonna let people um, out on bail if we think that maybe they're going to leave the country? Right. You're going to, yeah, that's right. Those those are all considerations the judge makes um, when deciding, you know, the factors of, about how much your bond should be or your bail should be. Yeah. Okay, cool. And so now I want to hear a little bit about day in the life of like the things that I see on TV that you probably do. So, you know, you have a, a criminal defendant and he's like, hey, I didn't do this. I want to go to trial, you know, or I want to defend myself. And you're like, all right, let's do it. What can you, you know, play that out for us? And let's say that he wins this case. Sure. Um, well, it really depends on the type of case, but let's just say it's like um, a run, like, my client is in custody and he's pending a felt like a robbery or something. Um, so after arraignment, that case gets set to, I have the case at arraignment. Um, usually at that point, we're, I'm trying to collect all the information I can, which means discovery. So just like in civil procedure, we also have what's discovery and um, criminal procedure. And that is that all that information usually comes from the district attorney's office or the, the police agencies through the district attorney's office. But then I also have investigators to do investigation based on things my client is telling me, possible defenses, um, if there are mental health considerations and doctors, experts, all of that is being done pre-trial uh, working up the case to trial. In California, I don't know about Florida, there is a hearing called a preliminary hearing. Is that something you guys have? 
Of course. Yeah, we have preliminary yeah. hearings. And okay. what happens at a preliminary hearing? So pre a preliminary hearing is a probable cause hearing. So like at trial, the the you know, it's um beyond a reasonable doubt. The jury has to uh, you know find you guilty. At the preliminary hearing, the magistrate, the judge has to um, basically the district attorney's office puts on evidence against your client and you can put on evidence too. And the judge will hear all the evidence, just the judge, no jury, and will determine whether or not there's probable cause to hold your client over for trial. That just, that it's just kind of like a safe, a safe stop. It's like, this case is trash. There's no evidence. This case should be dismissed. And a judge can dismiss a case at that stage if it's trash. Cool. That's the same words I used yesterday about uh, civil procedure and dismissing a case. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what happens during a trial? Like, do you, you know, what's the order of presentation, you know, and, and who are you going up against? And then how is the case, the verdict handed out? The fun stuff. Yeah. So at trial, I mean, it can be very, very quick or it can be super slow years in the making, depending on your speedy trial rights and the dates and times for that. But let's say we're at trial. The first thing that happens are pretrial motions. We call them motions and limine. Motions and limine. Just real quickly, does anyone out there know the dates for speedy trial for um, misdemeanors and felonies in Florida? One seventy five for felonies and ninety for misdemeanors. Nice, good job. Um, and then fifty days if you make the demand. Exactly, fifty days if you make the demand for speedy trial, and then um, ninety for misdemeanor, one seventy five for felony. Now, what if there is a felony and a misdemeanor in the same information? Do you get the ninety or the one seventy five? The 175. Exactly. Cool. Um, all right. Sorry to steal your thunder, Barbara. So let's continue about this trial. What's going on here? Yeah. So you motions eliminate. So that's basically you are asking the court, like you're you've been discovered everything that the, the district attorney's office is going to present. Um, so you're looking at that and saying you're moving to exclude maybe testimony by experts that are garbage fake experts or excluding reference to your client's prior convictions. It's a whole bunch of stuff. And you're also asking the court to allow you to introduce certain evidence. So it's basically, you know, the judge deciding what the land, what the landscape of your trial is going to look like. And that actually can be where you win and lose your trial because you, you will need some very important evidence or you're hoping the district attorney's office isn't able to present super prejudicial evidence against your client. So it's you versus the district attorney and you present, you know, evidence, they present evidence and then it goes to the jury, right? Right. Well, you pick, yeah, you pick a, you pick the jury first. That's the oh, big we, part we of it. Oh, we skipped a very important process. Yeah, the voir yeah. dire. Um, yeah. Can you explain that, the voir dire um, to the class? Yeah. So voir dire is, um, it's a French Sorry, term. <laughs> it's okay. It's a French term. Um, yeah, it, it's like two words, just like to see and to say, uh, you know, and yeah, the, actually the, the defense goes first in California. You question the jury, the DA questions the jury, um, and then we go through this process where we start kicking people off the jury. <laughs> and um, there's preemptory, and then there's for cause, similar to civil. Um, once when you, you say to, preemptory, yeah. what does that mean? What does that term mean, preemptory? Preemptory means you can basically take someone off for any reason. Um, they're like looking at me funny. <laughs> so, what, if, what if I'm a bigot and a racist and I want to kick them out because of the race? Yeah, you can't do that. And so that's, those are called Batson Wheeler motions. Um, and so there's certain ways to call out the opposing party for kicking off a member of a protected class. Yeah. Cool. So, so yeah. The, the voir dire, as I was today years old, I learned how to pronounce that. 
is this process, and I've been part of that, luckily they didn't choose me, where they're trying to find jurors. And um, what are you know some reasons when you say for cause that we wouldn't select the juror? Let's say someone in the robbery case, someone was robbed at gunpoint you know, five years ago, and it traumatized them. Um, and in the jury selection, they say, you know, I wouldn't be able to be fair to Mitch Wolf's client because I was robbed, so I can't follow the law, right, basically. Basically, for causes, if you are not able to follow the law as instructed to you by the judge, then um, we can kick you off for cause, yeah, bias, um, yeah. Cool, so, okay, so you selected jury members, then they sit, they hear the, the um, both sides, and then it goes to the jury for decision, right? Yeah, and like civil, there's also motions for verdicts um, for, that you can make prior to, like the, like, let's say the district attorney always presents first. Um, I'll, oftentimes I'll make a, a motion at the end of their case saying that there's not enough evidence to proceed and that the court should dismiss it right then and there. It's kind of like a, a power move. You're kind of, I mean, it, it can work sometimes, but usually it's denied the standard is pretty hard to make. But yeah, then after both sides present their evidence, um, yeah, it goes to the jury. And how many, in, how many people are usually in the jury? So 12 jurors in California, and um, typically we have like three or four alternates. So in Florida, it's, it's really only six, unless it's a capital case, then it's 12. That's, that's how we do it here. Um, it usually consists of six jurors, unless it's a capital case, which requires 12. But that's, that's cool. It's very similar. So, um, and does anyone know the standard of proof in a criminal case? Beyond the reasonable doubt, the prosecutor. And then and they bring up defenses. No, I forgot the standard for defenses, but I, I think it's clear and convincing, I think. Like the defendant. Yeah, so defenses don't have the same uh, standard of proof as the actual underlying claim, which has to be beyond the um, beyond the reason of shadow of doubt. But uh Defenses could have like a, a, a more likely true than not, depending on what the defense may be. But um, OK, so we have this case and the, the verdict has been uh, decided. And if they're guilty or innocent, what happens? Hold on just one second. Going back to the burden of proof is going to be squarely on the prosecution. So you don't have to even present evidence as a defendant at all. It's completely the burden of proof to present, like, let's say I wanted to present an affirmative defense. There are some, there's some level of information I have to provide to the court to allow that defense for the jury to hear it. But otherwise, it's just based on the prosecution. So after it goes to the jury, I mean, there's a few ways it can go, right? Um, uh, you can have a unanimous uh, not guilty verdict. Um, a unanimous unanimous guilty verdict, uh, um, or you could have a split verdict, which results in a mistrial. Cool. All right, Barbara, I'm gonna let you off the hook for now. I think that was really amazing because you'll see when I do this PowerPoint and when I do the um, uh, outline, a lot of it is just understanding how this really plays out. And for you, Barbara, you have a leg up on a lot of people. For everyone else, hopefully that was illustrative of how a case progresses and we'll see, it really is the things that she was talking about. So um, I think we could see this PowerPoint. Um, first thing was talking about that pretrial custody and release. So when these are the things that you have and, and Barbara talks about these, the notice to appear, the first appearance, the probable cause determination and an adversarial probable cause preliminary hearing. So um, does anyone know, uh, <laughs> what any of these things are or the difference between a probable cause determination and an adversarial probable cause preliminary hearing? Does anyone know what that means, adversarial? 
Is that a term that you use, Barbara? So um, we would, the probable cause determination is a preliminary hearing. We, the, those two are the same in California. And they, they often happen, all these happen at the same time, like at a first yeah. appearance. Appointed counsel, defendant given advice by the judge, the defendant or the judge determines where the defendant will be released. And usually a probable cause determination occurs during the first appearance, like, like you were saying. Usually that happens. However, it's uh, required to occur if all never necessary paperwork is completed. So these are some uh, ideas that we'll, we'll talk about. The accused is charged with uh, capital felonies and proof of guilt is evidence or the presumption of guilt is great. So those are times when they're not entitled to release. Right, if they're charged with a capital offense or the proof of guilt is evident, the presumption of guilt is great. Um, and, and the outline will make these things more clear. I'm just kind of going over quickly some of the ideas that we're going to talk about. So, we're moving the case pre trial, we'll have the charging documents. And Barbara was telling us those could be, you know, information, it could be an indictment, it could be a citation, it could be anything that has the documents. Um, then there could be uh, joinder and severance of offenses and defendants. So we consider, are there any other claims that need to be joined or are any of the offenses need to be separated and heard separately? Um, you could have motions for speedy trial, change of venue, disqualification. Um, and then as Barbara was kind of explaining during this time, you have plea bargaining, the arraignment, the thing that Donald Trump had to show up at, plea proceedings, and then different motions to dismiss, to suppress, incompetence to proceed and for continuances. So we had charged can file a demand for speed trial within 60 days of arrest. Um, and then we talked, we'll, we'll go on the next slide. Within 15 days of demand for discovery, uh, the state shall disclose most discoverable information. So this is kind of the moving the case process. Um, when we get to trial, we have that voir dire, which is the jury selection, closing arguments and the deliberation process for jurors. Like we said, jurors consist of six, unless it's a capital case, which is 12. And at the voir dire, the lawyers and court may ask questions to prospective jurors on the jury panel, and then make two types of challenges. For cause, which are unlimited, and the counsel must state the grounds. And then peremptory, which will be the same number for each side, and one additional for each alternate juror. So if the plaintiffs get three, the defendants get three. If there's Two defendants and I'm sorry, not the plaintiff. If the prosecutor gets three, the defendant gets three. If there's two defendants and you know now we get six, then both sides will get six. They'll always be the same for each side. Um, post trial, and we're going over this quickly because the outline is where we're going to get into the real details. I'm just trying to show us what we're going to talk about. Post trial, we'll have an appeal, a post conviction release, and motions for new trial, arrest of judgment, motion to vacate, set aside, or correct the verdict, and then sentencing. These are things that would happen after a trial. Um, a motion for a new trial must be filed within 10 days of the verdict or a court loses jurisdiction to hear. Mandatory, so per se, if the jury case decided by lot, that is tested every year for some reason. Like what is a reason why there must be a new trial? It was decided by lot. That term lot just means like totally at, at random. They flipped a coin. Um, the verdict is contrary to the, weight, the law or weight of evidence, but there's newly discovered evidence that would change the outcome. So these are reasons where you have to have a new trial. Um, however, the grounds for a new trial are not per se and prejudice must be proven. So you have to prove prejudice. If the jury received evidence out of court, the judge wrote incorrectly on the law during the trial or gave the trial incorrect instruction or the defendant for any reason not through his own fault did not receive a fair trial. So even if these things happen, you still have to show that you're prejudiced. So even if the jury received evidence out of court, okay, that doesn't mean we have to have a new trial. It just means that uh, if you can show prejudice, then it would be grounds for a new trial. Okay. Um, so jurisdiction of courts. I think this is definitely important and tested. Florida has a, a court pyramid where it's like Supreme Court is at the top, and then we have the DCAs, um, you know, District Court of Appeals. Uh, down here, we're the third DCA. I'm down here in Miami. Um, then we have trial courts, uh, circuit for the most serious cases, and county court for the less serious cases. Um, very similar to uh, the pyramid structure we have in civil. Trial court jurisdiction is divided between circuit court and county court. Oh, sorry. 
Um, in Florida, circuit court jurisdiction is limited. So there's 20 circuits in Florida, and they're the cases involving felonies, misdemeanors that have been joined for trial with one or more felonies, juvenile cases, and writs, for example, writs of prohibition, writs of mandamus, or writs of certiorari. In Florida, in Florida, county court has jurisdiction over any case that does not fall within circuit court jurisdiction. County court has jurisdiction over misdemeanors, except those joined with trial with a felony, violations of a county or municipal ordinance, and first appearance proceedings. So circuit court is going to be um, more serious, county court less serious. The Supreme Court is going to be, you know, if it's a capital punishment, if there's a death penalty or something, then maybe we'd go to the Supreme Court. Okay. Um, just some additional points from this PowerPoint before we really dig into uh, Joel's outline specifically. Um, the court cannot reduce a death sentence or mandatory minimum. A motion for reduction of sentence must be filed within 60 days of sentencing. A motion and arrest of judgment is essentially a tardy motion to dismiss, but must be filed within 10 days. Uh, the trial commences upon the swearing of the jury. That's when it starts. An alibi. So, you know, I have, I was in this city. If the defense raised an alibi defense, if the defendant raised an alibi defense, the defendant alibi defense on request. For example, if the prosecutor demands notice of an alibi defense, notice must be filed no less than 10 days prior to trial or is directed by the court. And then this we'll talk about more in detail on the outline, but if the state fails to formally charge the defendant by the 33rd day after the defendant's arrest, the defendant's release is required. So it's usually the third, the 30th day, but then you can have three additional days. And if they don't, uh, it could actually be extended all the way up to the 40th day for good cause. But we'll get into those details. Just know that they can't just keep you there after your arrest for too long without um, formally charging you. So those are, uh, you know, this, again, this PowerPoint is kind of broad and it's just to get everyone's mind started with what things are gonna be tested. One thing also that I'll show everyone real quickly that I think is important is just these dates and numbers, just like, uh, um, for civil procedure, you can really get a lot of questions right just by knowing uh, how, many, how much time you have for these things. Like you have 24 hours for the first appearance. For the non-adversarial probable cause hearing, it's 48 hours, but you could have two 24-hour extensions for good cause. The preliminary hearings within 21 days, indictment within 24 days. And this is what we were saying about 30 days, and then they have to release you after three days or you can get a seven day extension to make it 40 days. Um, these are just, you know, dates and times, but if you can remember these, you're likely to get questions right. The ones that are heavily tested are these two right here. The misdemeanor charge is 90 days and the felony charge is 175 days. Um, and this is what Hannah was saying. The demand for speed trial is 60 days and the actual trial has to be within 50 days of demand. Um, we talked about how it's six jurors in most cases, but 12 if it's a capital felony. And then, as I was saying, the preemptory challenges are always going to be the same per each side. So misdemeanors is three, non-capital felony is six, capital is 10. But remember, if there's like two defendants and it's a misdemeanor, then the prosecutor would get six because each defendant gets three, the prosecutor will get six. Uh, a lot of things are 10 days, motion for judgment of acquittal. 10 days and motion for arrest of judgment, 10 days after the verdict. Motion for a new trial has to be brought 10 days after the jury reaches its verdict. And a reduction or modification of sentences within 60 days. So those are you know, some important dates that we can see. Um, we went over last class the uh, that like power hour of the 100 questions that I did that are just give you the answers. I think that's very instructive. But I think the best thing we can do right now is look over uh, this outline and it's created by Joel that really synthesized all of our outlines into one. I think this is really amazing. And you can see that if we can go through this, we should feel confident. And then on uh, Saturday, come to the workshop and we'll do tons of questions together. And I really feel like the students in my course are gonna outperform everyone in Florida Multiple Choice just because of the diligence that we're taking. So let's talk about this. The Florida Supreme Court, what we would hear, um, capital cases, 
constitutional questions, bond validations, and we explained what that was last class, public utility questions, writs of jurisdiction, and adversary opinions. So remember, federal Supreme Court doesn't have adversary opinions, the Supreme Court may. Um, and then it has appellate jurisdiction. So the Supreme Court could have mandatory appellate review or discretionary appellate review of certain things. Um, and then capital case appeals from circuit court straight to the Florida Supreme Court. So big dogs that are coming into Florida Supreme Court. Just talked about this earlier, that circuit court, all prosecution here must be charged by indictment or information. That's an important piece. Um, all actions not cognizable by county courts. So exclusive over felonies and all felonies accompany misdemeanors, juvenile claims, uh, writs like writs of mandamus or writs of certiorari, and uh, real estate and tax assessments. And then county courts, these are civil cases, the lowest things, misdemeanors, municipal ordinances, first appearances, property possession rights, and these can come by information, indictment, affidavit, docket entry, notice to appear for misdemeanors or ordinance. By. That's a key point for circuit court has to be indictment or information for county court. It can literally be by docket entry. It can be by pretty much anything. Um, so the presence of the defendant, when must the defendant be present? Um, the Present, the defendant must be present for first appearance, either physically or by electronic audio visual device. During the arraignment, so we saw Donald Trump was at his arraignment, unless a written not guilty plea has been filed. Pre-trial conferences, unless waived. Beginning of trial and jury selection. And all proceedings in front of the jury, evidentiary proceedings outside the jury, viewings by the jury, rendition of the verdict, and sentencing. I don't know if Barbara is still here. I think she said she had to step out. But um, I'm here. Yeah, and you can confirm that, right? This is important. It's an important right of the defendant that they have to be present for all these things. Because if you're doing it outside their presence, you're depriving them of a fundamental right. That's important, right? Yes, um, that is important. And as an attorney, you, you want your client there to help you. But um, sometimes clients don't come. So there are actually times when you can move, uh, proceed without them. But sure. That's, but yeah. They have the right. However, if the defendant voluntarily leaves at any time, the trial may continue and disruptive defendant may be removed. So she was definitely foreshadowing that. They have the right, but, you know, they're not always there. Defendant charged with the misdemeanor may seek not to leave at any proceedings. Okay. So we have some important pieces right now the difference between Florida Supreme Court, Circuit Court, and County Courts. We talk when. When the defendant has the right to be present for first appearance, arraignment, pre-trial conferences, beginning of trial and jury selection, and then as Barbara was saying, a lot of times they have the right to be present, but their presence is actually doesn't end up occurring. So um, when can we compel the defendant to appear? So, uh, felony misdemeanor ordinance violations, the state or county judge issues an arrest warrant. Um, the clerk may issue a summons for misdemeanors only. Uh, the judge may issue a capius, which is a bench warrant, when the defendant failed to appear as required or charges are filed, but not in custody nor out on bail. Um, arresting or booking officer may issue a notice of appear in lieu of physical arrest for misdemeanor violations of municipal or county ordinances, unless the arresting booking officer may release and issue notice to appear unless the accused fails to identify himself or sign the notice to appear. The officer reasonably believes the accused liberty presents an unreasonable risk of harm to himself or others. The accused is a flight risk, past history of appearance at proceedings, and there's no ties to jurisdiction. So it must be a misdemeanor or city violation to apply. So these are just ways that we can get the defendant to appear. And just in general, think about the more serious the crime, the more serious of a measure is going to be needed to compel them. Um, appearance this arrest the in custody may must be brought to court within 24 hours of arrest this is mandatory 24 hours within your arrest to be brought uh to court you're there at your first appearance you'll be advised of your charges your miranda rights and your right to counsel remember you have a fifth amendment federally right to counsel when you are in custody and then your sixth amendment will attach after your adversarial proceedings have begun which is now um the indigent arrest you with possibility of jail time must appoint counsel before first appearance. Um, so that's important. In, an indigent arrestee doesn't necessarily need to be appointed counsel unless there's a possibility of jail time. 
So if the judge signs off that there's no possibility of jail time, then they don't necessarily need to be appointed counsel. The defendant charged with misdemeanor can waive their appearance if notice to appear. Then we have the pretrial release. All persons are entitled to a pretrial release unless there's a rebuttable presumption of no pretrial release if the person is charged with a capital offense or life imprisonment, the proof of guilt is evident or the presumption is great, or no conditions of release can assure defendant's appearance, community safest, safety, or judicial integrity. The defendant may rebut a presumption by establishing that release is appropriate. So that's in this plus proof of guilt, evidence, and presumption, great. It's presumed that we're not going to give them pretrial release, but you can rebut that. Um, you have a presumption of pretrial release for all their crimes and factors to consider are um, uh, nature and circumstances, the weight of the evidence, danger to community, community ties, mental state, and criminal history. These are things we'll consider. We talked about bail and bond, and Barbara did an amazing job explaining this concept. Conditions of release can be modified, re revoked, within only have to be good if released on bail, right? Um, the court may order pretrial detention if finding that the defendant with intent to obstruct judicial process, threatened, intimidate, or injured a victim or potential witness or juror or judicial officer, or is attempted to conspire to do so that no condition of release will reasonably prevent the obstruction of the judicial process. Um, did I freeze it all or you can all hear me? I'm good, okay. Let me know if I freeze it all and I'll go downstairs. Um, so pretrial detention. So if they're denied pretrial release and they're gonna be detained, then um, there is such thing as a writ of habeas corpus, which is a civil action petition, which is used by arrestee to appeal denial and the challenge conditions opposed on release. Um, I don't know if Barbara's still with us, but I'm not sure how often that really ha happens or how often that's very, very successful. But it is a right that you have to, you know, um, challenge the denial of pretrial release. And detention will be granted if the state filed a motion of first appearance or three days after the hearing, you previously violated condition, it's a human trafficking, violent felony, or DUI manslaughter, or you were under state supervision already at the time of the arrest. So understanding what pretrial detention means um her name is still rosie says it typically doesn't happen pre trial uh whether probable cause exists in a felony case to keep defendant in custody that's what happens at the preliminary hearing and i was asking about this non-adversarial versus adversarial and i don't think anyone really understood it, and i didn't want to mince words so now we can look at it together Non-adversarial determination. When held when defendant in custody and no arrest warrant was issued when arrested or not in custody, but liberty is significantly restrained. So we compare that no arrest warrant and they're in custody versus an adversarial determination. A felony defendant detained in custody and not formally charged within 21 days of arrest has a right to hearing and release of no probable cause unless information or indictment filed um, is filed. So we see the difference between a non-adversarial determination and an adversarial determination. These are two types of preliminary hearings, and adversarial determinations are um, required within 21 days when it's more serious felony defendant. Um, oh, I just got that. People said I'm cutting out. Uh, give me one second. Can you hear me better now? Clearly. Okay, cool. Now you can hear me. Um, Carolina, did you? I'm just going to repeat what I was saying. I'm sorry about that, but I was talking about the difference between a non adversarial determination and an adversarial determination. These are both preliminary hearings. Adversarial determination hearings are more serious. And this is when there's like a felony defendant and he hasn't been charged yet. And so within 21 days of arrest, he has a right to a hearing. A non-adversarial determination is just like um, less serious, right? No arrest warrant was issued and he's not in custody, but his liberty is significantly restrained. So a defendant in custody for a non-adversarial determination hearing, uh, probable cause determination must occur within 48 hours of arrest and a judge may grant two 24-hour extensions. When jo Joel and I were doing the practice questions, he was very keen on saying that. Um, 
If not in custody on pretrial release, the defendant can file within 21 days and the judge has seven days to determine probable cause. If no hearing held or no probable cause is found, the defendant is released. So these are, you know, confusing and convoluted concepts, but just know there's different types of preliminary hearings. And if it's non-adversarial, you have to be, um, a PC determination occurs within 48 hours of your arrest with two 24 hour extensions. And then if you have an adversarial determination, that's um, within 21 days of arrest. So, um, and if you're held in custody and no charges are filed, right? So after that determination hearing and still no charges have been filed, they must be filed within 30 days of arrest. And then at that moment, you make a motion and then they have to release you by the 33rd day or show good cause for delay, which is um, up to 40 days. So let's just make sure we understand that about when you have to be released after your arrest if they haven't brought charges against you. The true answer is 40 days, because it's 30 days, then they have to release you within three, unless they can show good cause to get up to 40. So I know criminal pro, criminal procedure is very nuanced and numerical, but I'm just telling you some of the things that they can test and we'll make sure to lock all these down uh, on Saturday. So arraignment, and now we're always gonna tie this with Donald Trump until the next famous person gets arraigned, um, occurs anytime the defendant is, after, anytime after the defendant is formally charged and it's the defendant's formal response in open court to the charges. So you could be advised of formal charges filed in the information the indictment and you can enter your plea. So guilty, the court will accept the plea if given voluntarily and there's factual basis and not guilty, appearance at arraignment can be waived with a not guilty plea or nolo contendere, contendere, which means like um, you are not contesting it, but you're not admitting that you're guilty. Uh, if the prosecutor is seeking a death penalty, must file notes within 40 days of arraignment. No death penalty for mentally disabled persons or persons under 17 years old, pregnancy can delay or avoid altogether. Um, defendant's appearance can be waived by entering a written plea of not guilty. Arraignment can occur any time after defendant is formally charged. So again, that arraignment, think of where you enter guilty or not guilty. And uh, we, we saw on TV or anyone may have saw on TV. So um, we could talk about plea bargaining and, you know, I'm going to go over some of these things a little bit quicker just to get through the material, but we won't end in class that soon. There's still probably 20, 25 minutes left. Um, Okay. Yeah, uh, Barbara's saying it means no contest, which is, it is what I was saying. It's a guilty plea of sorts, which means like, you're not technically admitting to guilt, but you're not contesting it, which is exactly what Barbara and I agree upon, that it means no contest. You're not contesting it and you're gonna accept the ramifications, but you're not entering a guilty plea. You're not admitting to the world that you are guilty of this. You're just not contesting it, but it does have more or less the same ramifications as guilty. So plea bargaining, you know, this is where you're going to, uh, um, to consider whether there is a, a settlement that can be made, right? Some sort of uh, agreement that can be made not to have to serve all of the uh, time. Um, this right here, an Alford plea, this was just on the news. Um, the young thug rapper case, all of his associates did Alfred pleas and now they're calling them snitches. But you know, it means they do not have to acknowledge guilt but must acknowledge the weight of evidence against them. So it's kind of a way of pleading but not super admitting guilt. Um, withdraw guilty plea anytime before sentencing, the court may permit and it must allow good causes shown. All right, so we have Pre-trial motions, um, motions to dismiss, uh, must be filed at or before arraignment, except if related to double jeopardy or some of these other issues. Um, motions to suppress, so based on constitutional violations. Um, yeah, motions to suppress the evidence. Uh, we have a lot of different motions that we can make. A big one, um, and we'll look at the second half of the outline, is the demand for speedy trial. And it's important that uh, you know the misdemeanor right to be tried within 90 days and the felony is a right to be tried within 175 days. Those are just very important things that you know, I could take from, from this, case, from this uh, outline. 
Um, motion to disqualify a judge, claim must be in writing, specifically allege facts and reasons, be sworn by the party under oath or affidavit, and a statement of good faith showing that the judge is prejudiced, related to a defendant within the third degree, related to an attorney in the third degree, the judge is a material witness in the case. These are reasons why um, we would disqualify a judge. So a judge must recuse themselves when related, either by blood or by marriage to the third degree to a person who's interested in the result of the action. Relation to a witness to any degree does not require a judge to remove themselves or be ordered. So they could if they're related to a witness, but not if they're uh, related to, uh, if they're related to an actual party, they have to recuse themselves. When I was called to do jury trial or to do the voir dire, there was someone who started speaking and then the judge was like, hey, I know this guy. And they had to not pick him. Um, so Florida defenses, we talked about the alibi defense. You know, you have to file at least 10 days before trial. Um, competency, whether they're, you know, not competent to stand trial. Uh, if they're found incompetent, the court may order treatment, review their condition every year, and dismiss it if they're not rendered competent after five years for a felony or one year for a misdemeanor. Um, insanity is another defense. It's determined at the time of the, defense, of the offense. So it's an affirmative defense of, of insanity. Um, it's different from incompetence. It's related to insanity by mental disease, and they must file notice within 15 days of arraignment. So discovery. Um, we, uh, similar to civil procedure, right? We're going to have an open discovery and we're going to disclose things, witness statements, exculpatory evidence obtained, expert names and expert reports, um, DNA evidence, grand jury minutes. That's for some reason tested. I've seen that as a question that this must be disclosed, grand jury minutes. Um, Defendants obligated for, to do reciprocal obligations. They must provide first list of witnesses expected to testify within 15 days of receiving the prosecution's discovery. They may also be required the defendant to appear in a lineup, provide physical samples, including fingerprints, blood, hair, and urine, provide writing or voice samples, try on clothing. It's not objectionable. If the, like they can't have them try on like a Borat suit, but they can have them try on like similar clothing. Um, depositions, they may be taken for felony cases, but not misdemeanor and traffic cases without showing a good cause. Exceptions to discovery, the parties not have to turn over work product, um, identity of confidential informants or limited surveillance location. So work product is like things made in anticipation of litigation. These are attorney strategies and mental impressions. Um, yeah, so I know scrim pro is a tough, boring subject, everyone. It just is what it is, and I'm just going over it. But I appreciate you all. So uh, trial order, um, you know, this is the order of trial procedures. I was asking Barbara if this was the same, where the state op has their opening statements, then defense opening statements, then the state's case, then the defendant's case, then the state's rebuttal, then the charge conference determined jury instructions, and then the three closing arguments, prosecution first, defense, and prosecution rebut. That's what we see on TV. This is the, you know, <laughs> back in my day, I would have said Ali McBeal. I don't know if anyone knows who that even is anymore. Okay. Um, jurors are, uh, we talked about this. Very important that you know. Six jurors generally for non-capital. For capital, it's going to be 12. Um, to be selected as a, as a juror, you have to be at least 18 a U.S. citizen, a Florida resident. Um, the defendant has a right to a list of prospectors, jurors, names, addresses, and questionnaire responses. So we already talked about this a lot, and Barbara helped us out. Um, just give me one second. Uh, the preemptory challenges are based on anything except for race, nationality, and gender, right? Like, that. those are the only reasons that we couldn't have a preemptory challenge. Otherwise, we're able to bring them and uh, it has to be in these numbers. You have 10 for capital crimes or like felonies. You have six for other felonies. 
three for misdemeanors. Remember, remember jointly tried, you get the sum. So each uh, gets the regular number and the state gets the sum. We kind of talked about that. Um, a lot more we can talk about on jur jurors and juries, but we'll kind of move forward. Um, probation, a judge may withhold adjudication and place the defendant on probation. Judge may dismiss charges if probation is uh, complied with. Different things for sentencing guidelines that are established by the Florida legislator. Um, we have to have a pre-sentence investigation report for first-time felony offenders, felony offenders under the age of 18. Um, capital case and defendant does not challenge a death penalty. So the judge may correct illegal and accurate sentences. Sentence may be modified within 60 days sentencing or receiving a appellate court mandate. And appeals from capital cases from trial courts are going to go directly to Florida Supreme Court. It does not first go to the DCA. Appeals from capital cases. So that's one of the ways we'll go right up to the Supreme Court. Um, the sentencing, you have the guilt phase where the jury decides guilt or innocence. The penalty phase, the jury decides the punishment, evidence, advocacy, or argument, and witness. And then the death penalty. Um, the jury must find aggravating factors beyond reasonable doubt. Judge must find no violation of cruel and unusual punishment. And it's unanimous is not needed. So exceptions, um, defendant is incompetent, you'll defer sentencing. Defendant has been pardoned, so there'll be no sentencing. Or if they're pregnant and set to death penalty, you have to wait until they've given, they've given birth. Uh, Post-trial motions, motion for new trials have to come within 10 days after the finding, the verdict finding the court or 10 days after the final judgment of the conviction. Um, remember by lot. I mentioned that I promise you that answer will come up. If the verdict was decided by lot, that's not going to be okay. Um, and these are other reasons why they would have to have a new trial. Um, judgment or acquittal, motion for judgment of acquittal is granted when there's no prima facie case. A reasonable jury could not find guilty after considering evidence in light most favorable prosecution made after the close of state's case or close of all evidence. Um, a motion for arrest of judgment is a dismissal based on the law or invalid proceedings it must be filed in 10 days of the guilty verdict. So that was about Florida post-trial motions. And then you have post-trial conviction relief. So I know Barbara did an amazing job of telling everyone the life cycle of the case, seeing it in excruciating detail, right? Every moment in the case has a lot of little laws. But as we'll see, um, on Saturday, we're going to do questions. And, and what I showed everyone at the beginning of class is probably the best way to score really high on this test is just to memorize the answers to the questions because you familiarize yourself with exactly what's tested. So uh, different things that we could have are motions to vacate, set aside, or correct a sentence. Um, these are, you know, different things that we could have. Uh, all court records and documents must be filed with the clerk. Judgment sentences must be filed with the court. An enlargement of time, a court may expand time for good cause, except motions for new trial, appeal, or acquittal. They have to be brought timely. Uh, different things about direct and indirect contempt. This question is asked for sure. Direct contempt. Contempt is direct when the objectionable conduct occurs in the presence of the judge. And indirect contempt. Indirect contempt occurs outside the presence of the judge. So direct contempt is in court. Indirect contempt is outside of court. Three strike, you're out for habitual criminals. So increase the penalty for habitual criminals and enhance penalties for hate crimes. And then sex predator laws, subsequent liberties taken away after serving time for crime, civil liberties like being labeled a sex offender. We have that in Florida. You can be labeled a sex offender um, and have to comply with uh, different laws if you've committed a sex offender crime. Um, okay. So, yeah, this is pretty much from my PowerPoint, just, you know, moving the case along. Um, we talked about different class of offenses. Capital is punishable by death penalty if found guilty. A felony, any criminal offense punishable by death or imprisonment in a state correctional facility for more than one year. A misdemeanor, any criminal offense punishable by imprisonment in county correctional facility for not more than one year. Non-criminal violations are punishable by more than a fine, forfeiture, civil penalty. This is important. You got to know the difference between capital crimes, felony, misdemeanor, and non-criminal. Misdemeanor, 
not um, not more than one year in jail, felony more than one year in jail, and capital crime something that you could be subject to the death penalty. Um, The state must offer to indigent or partially indigent persons in cases where conviction is punishable by incarceration, as well as for felonies, misdemeanors, juvenile offenses, and first direct appeal is included. Yeah, I think I'm bugging out, right? Sorry. Hey, sorry about that. Um, I think everyone lost me, but you can hear me again. I'm just saying that uh, the right to counsel, you have a right to counsel, but remember if you're an indigent and it's the, the judge says that no possibility you'll go to jail, then you don't have a, a mandatory right to counsel. Um, you could waive a right to counsel as long as it's knowingly, intelligently, voluntarily, and they're mentally competent. The waiver may be made out of court in writing with two witnesses and you're entitled to counsel at all stages of the proceedings. The judge must ask the defendant if they want counsel at each stage, even if waived, right? At each stage of the proceeding, you have to be reminded that you've waived counsel. Um, minimum standard for uh, attorneys, they must complete a course approved by the Florida Bar covering legal and ethical obligations and you know, capital cases. They must have tried as lead counsel in at least nine complex cases. That's tested very heavily. We talked about preliminary proceedings. Um, we talked about first appearance, pretrial release, pretrial detention, um, probable cause determination, and the difference between the non-adversary and the adversary preliminary hearing. Um, right? It's it's custody release within 30 days, but then plus three, 33, and then good cause could show up to the 40th day. We've already done all this. Formally charging a crime could be with indictment or information or for any of these other uh, smaller options if it's like a, you know, ordinance or county violation. Um, different ways, you know, joinder of offenses. Offenses may be joined based on the same act or transaction. Joinder of defendants. Indictment information may charge two defendants or more defendants if each defendant is charged in each count. Joint representation. If defendants have been joined for trial, they're represented and are represented by the same attorney, court must advise each of its right to separate representation. Offenses that could have been joined may be consolidated for trial upon motion of either side, and the defendant has a right to sever charges improperly joined. Um, pretty much going over the pretrial motions, we talked about all these. Remember, 50 days to make the demand for speedy trial, and then 90 days for the misdemeanor, 175 days for the felony. Uh, nothing else too different, right? Relation in the third degree will automatically disqualify them to someone who's party in the case. Um, it keeps spelling Daubert wrong, but yeah, Florida moved from Daubert to Fry back to Daubert. This is just the standard for uh, for admitting uh, an expert witness for qualifying an expert witness that they have to be, you know, knowledge, skill, expertise, training, and all those different things. Um, nothing that I don't think we've talked about before plea bargaining, right? Um, a plea bargain has to be made voluntarily and intelligently. You can't be forced to make a plea bargain. That's for sure. Arraignment, we talked about different types of pleas. It's got to be voluntarily and fully understood. Um, Right, double jeopardy. You can't be charged for the same crime twice. If you've already been found not guilty and it's the exact same crime, then you know you're not going to be able to be charged with it twice. Motions to spread to suppress evidence, motions for continuance generally must be made the time cases set for trial, it must be accompanied with certificate of good faith signed by counsel. We talked about most of these incompetencies and sanity defense. So Florida uses the McNaughton test. Defendant disability made it so that D did not understand the nature of his own actions, did not realize he was committing a crime. 
So McNaughton, as opposed to the model penal code or the irresistible impulse test, we use the McNaughton test, which just means that he did not understand the nature of his own actions and not realize he was committing a crime. Again, reinforcing this, six jurors for non-capital, 12 for capital. You got to be at least 18 and a citizen of Florida to be able to uh, participate as a jury, as a juror. Um, I don't know anything else that we haven't really talked about. Um, a verdict must be unanimous. I, I think we know that, but I don't think I ever mentioned that today, right? That a jury does have to be unanimous for a crime. Um, a judge or either side may pull the jurors individually to assure there's no uh, um, dissent and the judge may not comment on the verdict or the evidence. And then the punishment phase, after a guilty verdict, unanimous jury, not necessarily required for punishment, just for the verdict. So then we have uh, post-trial release, presumption of release for defendant guilty of any non-capital offense, release pending appeal or review or the case by trial. Pre-sentence investigation report we haven't talked about yet. A trial court may request a PSI um, when he has discretion on what sentence to oppose. So that's like a, you know, a report that's mandatory to the defendant who will be imprisoned or first felony or juvenile commits felony. It's just a report that's kind of helps a judge figure out what sentence to impose. Um, we talked about the pretrial motions, motion for new trial must be made within 10 days after the defendant's found guilty. Make sure everyone's got that down. The motion for a new trials within 10 days after the defendant's found guilty. Um, everything else I feel like we talked about so far. Um, yeah, different types of criminal content. And then, uh, whoosh, Joel made this cram guy that looks pretty amazing. And some tips. So let's take a look at some, some of these on the cram guide. Um, all persons in custody for the alleged commission of a crime are entitled to pretrial release on reasonable condition unless charged with a capital offense or an offense punishable by life imprisonment and proof of guilt is evident or presumption of guilt, guilt is great. So all people in custody are entitled to pretrial release. Only when a felony defendant has not been formally charged within 21 days of arrest is the defendant entitled to an adversary hearing to determine probable cause on all felony charges. So if they haven't been formally charged in 21 days, they're entitled to the adversary hearing. All capital, and they have to be a felony defendant. All capital crimes must be charged by indictment and all prosecutions in circuit court must be charged by indictment or information. Misdemeanors and ordinance violations may be prosecuted in county court by information. So they don't have to be, but they may be. A defendant on pretrial release is entitled to a probable cause hearing only if he files motion within 21 days of his arrest and can establish his release conditions or significant restraint on his liberty. That's an adversarial hearing. A defendant cannot be forced to pose for photographs to reenact the scene. There are some things that they can do. They can be forced to walk across and see if they have a limp. Is that right, Barbara? You're the only one still here. Sorry. Um, I don't, uh, I, I don't think in California, I mean, I would object to that, but. You would object I, to that. Yeah. Fair enough. But there is a question that says that it's okay for them to do that because it's like a physical thing so that you can walk to show that they had the limp like oj could put the glove on to show that it didn't fit there's certain things that they can do and, and you objecting yeah. is fine but the point i'm trying to make is you certainly can't make them pose for a photograph to reenact a scene that would be ridiculous um and i'm just talking Super to you prejudicial. Yeah. wait oh okay yeah i'm here <laughs> um a court may require a defendant to appear in a lineup be fingerprinted pose for a photo mugshot or allow prosecution to take their hair or other bodily material samples. The state may, for good cause shown, have two 24-hour continuances on a 40-hour time limit to have non-adversarial probable cause determination. When a misdemeanor and felony are consolidated for trial in circuit court, felony speedy trial rules apply to both charges, right? So like we said, if there's 90 and 175 days, you'll get the 175. An accused, and I, I want to reinforce this point because people are probably confused about the 50-60 right for the speedy trial. This will clarify it. An accused may file demand for speedy trial within 60 days at any time after the filing of formal charges if he has a bona fide desire to go to trial and failure by the state to bring an offended to trial within 50 days after the demand 
entitles a defendant to file a notice of expiration of speedy trial time. So they have to file it within 60 days. And then um, if they're uh, after the, for wait, they may file the demand within 60 days at any time after the filing of formal charges, if they have a true desire to go to trial and failure by the state to bring a defendant to trial within 50 days after the demand entitles the defendant to file notice of expiration of speedy trial time. So after 50 days, you can file the notice um, and you have within 60 days. A defendant for speedy, for speedy that has not been filed prior to an information is void. You cannot manifest since the defendant was not aware of the charges, right? So you have to be charged first before you make a demand for speedy trial. A defendant is entitled to grand jury minutes only if he testified before the grand jury, then entitled to only a transcript of his testimony, right? Grand jury proceedings are secretive, so you can't get other people's testimony, just yours. Um, Defendants voluntarily failure to attend trial while released on bail does not prevent court from continuing the trial. Barbara's probably saying that. Um, judges may issue a capious revoking defendant's bail for failure to appear in trial because required to be present for all proceedings before court when the jury is present. Defendant can be required to pose for photos for identification purposes, not to reenact create a crime scene. Um, let's skip down a little bit. Uh, a defendant enters his plea at arraignment. It's not proper for a judge to consider a defendant's prior arrest record, only prior convictions. Defendant is required to prove prejudice against himself, not a judge's distaste for that crime charge, nor judge being a former prosecutor, nor judge campaign for being tough on drugs. In Florida, several types of charging instruments for crime, indictment, information, notice to appear, docket entry, or affidavit. It depends on classification. And just to make sure someone here is awake, does anyone know um, when you need to be charged with indictment or information? For felonies. For felonies, good job, thank you. Information can contain a fictitious name, John and Jane Doe, if the name is unknown at the time of filing or to protect. Um, ooh, he bolded this one, so it's important. Within 30 days of sentencing, a defendant who pleads guilty or no low content, contender without expressing right, may file a motion to withdraw plea, but only on the following grounds. Trial court lacks subject matter jurisdiction, violation of plea agreement, the plea was involuntary, or sentencing error. Um, sentences for any crimes, including a sentence for sexual battery or murder, may run concurrently with a sentence for any other charge, any other offense charged in the same indictment or information. Multiple sentences for crimes charged in one indictment or information usually run concurrently, Sentences for multiple offenses charged in separate indictments usually run consecutively. So you, you'll understand, does everyone understand the difference between concurrent and consecutive? If you were convicted of a, two crimes, would you rather your sentences run concurrent or consecutive? Concurrent. Right, because consecutive would be back to back. Concurrent would be get it all done in one fell swoop. But no one in here is serving any crimes, um, serving any time. So, he made us some Florida Crim Pro exam tips, an acronym for circuit court jurisdiction, misfelish, misdemeanors joined with felonies, felonies, writs, and juvenile cases. If that helps you, then cool. An acronym to help remember what happens at first appearance. Okay, I like this. CARP 24. Within 24 hours, the hearing provides counsel, advice, release, and sometimes a probable cause determination. That's pretty solid, CARP 24. Carpe diem, seize the day. Charging instruments, technical requirements. You can use the mnemonic device, nice Santa. This is why this person who created this did so well in this exam. You can see he went the extra miles. Name of alias of the accused, intent to defraud, um, in general terms or caption, endorsement or signature, an indictment must be signed by the four person of the grand jury and by the prosecutor, endorsed by the prosecutor, signature and oath, State attorney must sign and swear to the information. Authority under whose auspices, the auspices, the indictment or information is being filed. Nature of the offense, time and place, where and when the offense occurred as definitely as possible. An allegation of facts must be made for each count. The grounds for disqualifying a judge are often tested on the bar exam. Here we go. A motion to disqualify a judge alleges that the judge is prejudiced for or against a party related to the defendant within the third degree, 
related within the third degree to a lawyer in the case or to any judge who participated as a lower court judge in the case, a material witness in the case. The motion must be in writing, specifically allege the facts and reasons, be sworn to by the party under oath or by affidavit, and be accompanied by a separate statement of good faith made by counsel. Um, let's see. Waiver of counsel, VIK, voluntarily, intelligent, and knowingly. I like that. Like we like mnemonics. The three closing argument orders frequently tested on the bar exam. Okay, I didn't know that, but now we know that. The closing argument is, is first. The plaintiffs are, you see, I obviously like civil better than criminal. The um, uh, prosecutor's closing argument, the prosecuting attorney opens closing arguments. Then the defendant's closing argument, which is optional. The accused or the attorney for the accused may reply. And then the prosecutor's rebuttal. Only if the defendant has a closing argument. If the accuser or his attorney replies, the prosecuting attorney may reply in the rebuttal. So that's the order tested. Prosecutor closing argument, then the defendant if he wants, then the prosecutor rebuttal if he chooses. I've seen this go down on TV. Ground for and timeliness of motions for new trials are frequently tested on the bar exam. Here we go. A motion for a new trial may be made within 10 days after the defendant is found guilty. I've said that like 10 times in this lecture. I hope that's stuck. A trial court must grant a new trial if any of the following is established. Mandatory new trial. The verdict is decided by lot. We said that many, many times. Um, the trial court must grant a new trial if grounds are established, plus the defendant's substantial rights were prejudiced, right? So we said these reasons, um, it's not pro se, it's just uh, if this happens, plus you can show some sort of prejudice, then you can, uh, then you have to grant a new trial. And after a motion for a new trial, the court may deny the motion, agree up to a point, but find the defendant guilty of a lesser degree or necessarily include lesser offense or grant the motion. All right, this was a 35 page super tsunami outline made by one of the best performers on criminal procedure in Florida multiple choice that I've ever seen. So I think it's great. I also have in here my own outlines, some of our old outlines that we've made, the PowerPoint and the timing sheet, and then the questions. The one thing I wanna to do to end class today, just a quick little quiz, you know, a few questions, just to make sure there's some life out there. And then we will um, call it a night. So, Let's do this. A defendant charged with first degree murder shall be furnished with a list containing names and addresses, addresses of all prospective jurors upon court order, upon request, upon request and showing a good cause or under no circumstances. I believe this is taken directly from the FBBE questions because I just kind of remember it. Does anyone know? It's not something I talked about today. It's just, we're gonna have to do a workshop on Saturday to to plug in the details. Upon request? I think upon request, yeah. Let's go with upon request, right? So a defendant charged with first degree murder shall be furnished with a list containing names and addresses of all prospective jurors upon request. This is straight from the Florida Board of Bar Examiner's questions. All right, number two. Um, defendant was seen leaving neighbor's yard with neighbor's new $10 garden hose. Neighbor called the police who charged defendant with a second degree misdemeanor of petite theft by issuing a notice to appear in the county courthouse one week later. Defendant appeared at the scheduled place and time and asked the judge to appoint a lawyer to represent him. The judge found defendant to be indigent. The judge must appoint defendant a lawyer, must appoint defendant a lawyer if the state subsequently charges defendant by information, need not appoint defendant a lawyer if the judge states in writing that defendant will not go to jail for more than six months of convicted, need not appoint defendant a lawyer if the judge states in writing that defendant will not go to jail at all if convicted. D. D, right? We said that in class today. There is a method to this madness. Barbara, what are you talking about being crazy? You're such a defender of people. You just have to well, accept it. <laughs> if you're indigent, I mean, this is a, anyways, that's crazy. Yeah, I know. Well, you're coming to Florida to save the day, so we're counting on you. All right. Defendant was arrested on February 1st and released one month later on March 1st after being charged with a felony. On December 1st of the same year of his, as his arrest, he filed a motion to discharge since no trial or other action had occurred to that point. The court held a hearing three days after the motion was filed. Defendant should be discharged because more than 175 days passed between arrest and the filing of the motion to discharge. Discharged because more than 175 days passed between his release from jail and the filing of his motion to discharge. Brought to trial within 90 days of the filing of the motion to discharge 
or brought to trial within 10 days of the hearing on the motion to discharge. Again, not something I don't think I mentioned today, but see who knows this. This is the process. We have a C. Any other guesses? So they held the hearing three days after. Arian saying D. I like that, Arian. Good job. It is D. That's the procedure. If they, you know, there's no activity and they bring up the, um, you know, 175 or 90 days here, it's a felony, 175 days. It's not that you're automatically released. It's that they have to bring you within 10, 10 days of the motion. And then they have to release you if you don't have that trial. So that's how that goes. Again, very nuanced and good job, Arian. Proud of you. All right, number four, Andrew, what is he up to? Andrew was charged with grand theft. The trial began on Thursday afternoon. The jury was impaneled, sworn and released for the day. Since Friday was the 4th of July, the judge asked the jurors to return on Monday. The trial began again on Monday morning at 8.30. By late evening, the judge had instructed the jury. Due to the lateness of the hour, the juries were sequestered for the evening to allow them to get an early start the next morning. The jurors returned Tuesday morning and were unable to reach a verdict. Unable to reach a verdict, the trial judge allowed the jurors to go home that evening. On Wednesday morning, the jury assembled and issued a verdict of guilty. On appeal, which of the following is Andrew's strongest issue for seeking a reversal? The fact that the jurors did not begin to consider evidence until several days after they were impaneled. The fact that the jury was allowed to go home after being sworn. The fact that the jury took several days to return a verdict. The fact that the jury was allowed to go home after they began deliberations. D's and D's, mostly D's. Yeah, D, right? Once deliberations have begun, you guys are stuck in that jury box, which is why I do not want to be on a jury. All right. A defendant is not tried within the required time period. A defendant may file a demand for jury trial, expiration of speedy trial time, a plea, guilty, not guilty, nolo contendere, or demand for acquittal or dismissal. What do we think? D's and B's, B's is coming in strong. Yeah, there's going to be a B, expiration of speedy trial time. All right, just because we have a little bit more time. And I thought no one was there because no one had their camera on today. I was like, I'm just talking to myself, but at least there's life. In the absence of a demand for speedy trial, a defendant has the right to be tried within how many days of a felony? Come on, everyone. A, B, or C, or D. 90, 175, one year, three years. Yeah, got to be B. I know we're learning some things. At least I'm enforcing the things that are heavily tested because trust me, this is hard. Which of the following is not true of capital cases? They may be tried only upon jury indictment. 12 people must sit on the jury. Alternate juries are discharged at the conclusion of the guilt phase of the trial. Pregnancy of the defendant may prevent execution of sentence. Which is not true. Mostly A's and one C. Any other guesses? Mostly A's in one C, another C? Yeah, C. The jurors are instructed to remain in the courtroom, right? Alternate jurors are not going to be discharged. And we do know this, you can only be, a capital case has to be a grand jury indictment in Florida. Maybe that's not how it is in other states, but in Florida for sure. In a capital case, hey, what's up, Anna? Nice to see you. In a capital case, the defendant is not required to be present for first appearance, view of the crime seen by the jury, jury selection, arraignment, if his attorney has filed a written not guilty plea. Any thoughts here? I think we did talk about this one. Yeah, D's. Yeah, D's are coming in, right? Because arraignment. And I'm never saying, I have to be very careful about what I say after D because I made a joke apparently last time. In the absence of a demand for speedy trial, a defendant has the right to be tried within how many days of arrest for misdemeanor? My class of learners. Yeah, C, C, C. Cool, and question 10. A judge may correct an illegal sentence or one based on miscalculations, never within 90 days of sentencing at the judge's discretion or any time after sentencing. Illegal sentence on miscalculations, what do we think? Never? Anytime? Discretion? 90 days? Zero answers? B? One B? One brave B? B's, B's, a D? A D? A couple of D's are coming in? Yeah, I think D at any time at any time if it's a legal sense based on miscalculation. So make sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. You already know the vibes. I know this was a very long, difficult session, but trust me when we come back on Saturday and we have our procedure workshop from 11 to one, 
I'm really going to tie a bunch of uh, I'm going to tie a bunch of things together. So thank you all for bearing with me. It's been a pleasure. Thank <music> you.